Welcome to another FAQ Monday. I'm your host, Fluff. And today, I'm drinking tea, not coffee. I know, you guys were waiting, you were wondering what I was drinking. And it's tea, it's not coffee. It's too late in the day for coffee. I got, uh, I got a late start, got busy. Tea. That's what happens when you're old, like me. First question. Hey, Fluff. Hi from France. I am looking at the orange micro terror and I was wondering, is it loud enough to play in a stoner band? Love your videos, cheers. Um, no. The micro terror, it's loud. It's really loud amp for being almost the size of a, you know, pedal or something. It is super loud. I don't know if it could hang with a stoner metal band or a stoner rock band because that genre specifically relies a lot on the element of volume. That, I mean, you probably play in a loud ass band and mm, I would say no, even with the 412, it's probably not gonna get you, it probably can get that loud. It's not gonna sound very good. You're gonna run out of clean headroom. It's gonna start distorting cause you're gonna have to be almost all the way up. Um, no, I would definitely step up to a Tiny Terror or an Orange Micro Terror, the Jim Root head. Honestly, if you can afford it or save your money, get the Jim Root signature head. That will be instant stoner doom metal rock genre kind of stuff and you'll be better off for it after all the amps that you've demoed what would you say your opinion is now on the bugera tri rec for the money um you know honestly they all worked and sounded great when i had them but as i slowly rotated them out of the amp collection over time i would always hear like two months down the road the all the amps would fry or give up and just the style would never turn on again uh, they would pop tubes and you know, they were always constantly popping fuses or something like that after a couple of gigs Honestly when people write me and they write me a lot asking me about the Bugera because the Bugera price point is very very attractive I tell them no go for the used market get like a used PB 5150 or Look at something a company like Panama Panama has great bang for the buck amps that are actually reliable and don't fry after a gig so honestly you know, you want to love the Bagheera. I want to love the Bagheera stuff, but they're just, they're not reliable. They're not, but they sound good when they do work, but it doesn't really matter if they don't turn on. Fluff, can using the Fredman miking technique count as tracking two rhythm guitars at once? What about placing two mics on two different areas of the speaker straight on? Uh, the short answer of that question, sir, is no. No, it cannot. Multiple mics do not equal multiple performances. No matter how many mics you were using on a given guitar cab or many guitar cabinets, one performance still will sound like one performance. Now, you can use a stereo widening plug-in or something like that to make it a little wider, but that still does not sound like two, it doesn't sound like two tracks, it doesn't sound like a multi-tracked guitar, and really you just gotta play it twice or more. So, you know, for the Fire Breather EP, I quad-tracked the rhythms, which was a huge, huge challenge, and I totally regret doing it, although it was a good learning experience, but nope, you gotta track it twice. In regards to the Fredman technique, the Fredman technique was pioneered by Mr. Fredman and he used it uh, most notably on In Flames' uh, Clayman record. And that's an SM57 straight on and an SM57 at a 45 degree angle, perfectly in face with each other on a specific spot on the microphone. And only recently I got a clip pictured right here that you can put 257s in the clip and it will get you right where you need to be in phase, it's awesome, and in the mic's index on a little part of the seam where the uh, where, where the body screws together. Amazing, amazing clip. But if you don't know more about the Fredman technique, I highly recommend you read up on it if you're into miking guitar cabs. I mean, it's been used on countless guitars, most notably, I think, for the newest Architects record. He used that, they used him on the record, and the guitars are a great example of how huge you can get it sounding with that miking technique. I don't think I have ever heard you comment on PV cabs. I actually really like PV cabs. I think the 5150 cab was awesome. It's not really a vintage 30 thing. Obviously the speakers were modeled after a greenback, but generally speaking, I think PV really, really excelled at matching speaker voicings to their amps. And I used, for a long time, I had a triple X 4x12 cabinet that was really, really awesome because it kind of modeled a vintage 30-ish kind of thing. More so like a Eminence Governor is what they really sounded like. But uh, that cab was super, super awesome. And I had that for several years. And the first 4x12 I ever had actually was a PV412 from the mid 80s. And it had like the, the metal panel things on the side and the grill came off. 
and I put some Jensen mod speakers in it and I beat the crap out of that thing for a lot of years in my punk band. Um, but yeah, if you find a, a PV cabinet cheap on the used market, usually you can find them for like $200. Um, I highly recommend you grab it because their speakers will take a pounding and so will the cabs. This week, I suggest you check out a new teeny tiny baby company called Rattlesnake Cables. They're making some super killer cables. They sent me one to just kind of check out and get my feedback on. I've been using it for a lot of high gain reamp stuff and the signal to noise ratio on these cables is really, really good. Uh, sounds like a great cable. It, it sounds great and is a great cable. Um, it also feels very good. It's heavy duty, good connection, good connections on the end, all around awesome product. I just, I really dig it and thought you guys would too. You've been wonderful, I've been Fluff. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you next time.